I would like to introduce Dr. Alan Frank. Uh, he is with the University of Florida, uh, the Florida Museum. And he's here today to discuss the human impact on Florida's plants and animals dating from our arrival 14,500 years ago. And his presentation is what's gone wrong, what's new, what remains, plus innovative new ways to protect this treasure house that is Florida. So with that, Dr. Alan Frank, it's all yours. Okay, thank you. Uh, let me see and share my screen. I didn't, I didn't update my, my title to, I guess, uh, what, what you just read, but it's the same gist. Let's see here. Um, my screen shown, are we good with there? I can see it. Let's see. Yeah, we're good. I think so. Okay, so um, uh, so I get. I originally uh, concocted this talk for a rare plant task force uh, that was held in uh, April, I think, of last year. And uh, a lot of it is kind of the uh, perspective on what humans have. Uh, what humans have affected uh, in our in our environment and the biodiversity, but it was the rare plant task force, so I kind of talked about a lot of rare things. But that's you know often what we're interested in. So um, let me jump in here. So I guess you know it's really fascinating to think uh, what we've done. You know, you can grow up in Florida and live you know your one generation and learn about what's rare and what's what we're protecting and everything like that. But we, what's great about humans is our capacity to uh, document things and store information. That's one of the most hu uh, human characters that we have, I'd say. And so to try to like give a story of everything that we've done is, is pretty fascinating to, to see where we're at now. So maybe about 14, 15,000 years ago, we have the first evidence of humans, uh, the Oscilla River. Let's see, there's my mouse. I don't know if that, does my mouse show up, by the way? Okay, good. Um, so we find a, a biface. So there's a, a, chisel, a chiseled uh, piece of rock chiseled on both sides. And that's kind of the first evidence of humans in Florida. And from about 14 to 10,000 years ago, we see all these dots and areas. So those are various uh, um, archaeological sites for humans uh, in that area. So uh, yeah, yeah. 10 to 15,000 years ago. So you can see most of the most of Florida, maybe even uh, this Cutler fossil site in Miami or all the way down there. And what's fascinating is there's been one study finding a spruce pollen. So that's the genus Picea. Of course, we don't have any native spruce here anymore, but it shows that the climate may have been very different uh, back then. And also Florida was much larger. So these gray lines here, uh, they come around here. So about 15,000 years ago, the, the sea level was about 120 meters uh, lower than it is now. So Florida is maybe twice as big. So there's probably a lot of uh, sites where humans lived along the coast that we won't discover for a long time perhaps, or maybe we'll find something someday. And, um, so even on our first arrival, there's speculation that we uh, had a pretty dramatic influence on uh, the wildlife of the area. So, you know, what happens with a lot of the plants, we, it's hard to find that fossils, but, you know, animals are, a lot of animals are big. So big animals, we find evidence of them and we find evidence of them disappearing, basically. So these species are thought to have lived with humans and then they've disappeared. So some large armadillos, uh, a different genus of bears, Right, the one we have is Ursus. This is Tremarctos, uh, a historic species of bison, Bison antiquus, um, Smilodon, so the saber-toothed cat, horses. Right, so we had native wild horses, uh, llamas, mammoth, mastodons. Right, those very large animals, peccaries, giant ground sloths, and uh, tapirs. So it's pretty fascinating that humans could have been living alongside of them, and then suddenly they disappeared. Um, there's, it's, it's hard to speculate exactly what happened, but humans probably had some influence, but it was also a time of a very dramatic shift in climate uh, where uh, it got much cooler very quickly. So it's guessed that over just a few decades, the 
uh, average temperature dropped several degrees. So that kind of um, that kind of ends our little chapter on 10, about 10,000 years ago. Uh, after 10,000 years ago, uh, we kind of have a short disappearance of humans. Uh, we, we don't find evidence of them. Maybe they were confined to the coast and it was a really much colder climate. And uh, of course the coast has a more moderate climate. So maybe they clung to there, but it's a bit hard to say, but we get human evidence reappearing about seven, 8,000 years ago. Uh, some shell mound architecture. So we see a lot of that, and that has some really rare species with some fascinating things. Well, what's kind of cool is there's uh, two species of plants in the genus Celtis. Uh, uh, up north, they call these hackberries or sugarberry as a common species around here. But here are two species, Celtis aguania and pallida, that are basically only found on shell mounds. So it's, it's bizarre to think that we created this habitat where maybe these two species uh, only like to be in Florida, at least. So in the tropics, they're a little bit more uh, common, of course. Also this time, um, we seem to be getting a wetter climate. So uh, these are some pollen records and 10, so 15, 10, 5,000 years ago. So you can see in, in this uh, pollen site in Highlands County, oaks dramatically decline. So it's thought that scrub oaks might, might make a lot of this pollen up and pines suddenly become more common. And it's thought that that's indic indicative of a moister climate. All right, so uh, getting up to more recent history. All right, so the Spanish arrive in around 1513. Um, the, the indigenous population, maybe 50 to 100,000, a bit difficult to say. And then 1565, we get uh, St. Augustine established, right? Our, our basically our, our oldest uh, city. And uh, that's an international port. So we have a lot of international uh, exchange here. Uh, Havana, Cuba, Vera, uh, Veracruz, Mexico. So there's a lot of Spanish uh, commerce coming from those places in, in activity. And about a hundred year later, years later, we've um, Europeans have disseminated a lot of uh, diseases and that's running rampant in indigenous populations, smallpox, malaria, measles, to name a few. And of course, citrus, cattle and pigs have been introduced and they're becoming a little more established on their own right. And uh, strangely, the, the bison species that uh, live now in uh, the US makes an appearance in North Florida. And it's not really clear if it's uh, that it was here historically before then or it's just kind of adapting to some sort of disturbance, but uh, there were some bison around North Florida. And then in the 1700s, we lose our indigenous population, basically. Um, some of them might have gone to Cuba. Um, most probably died, uh, but we, we don't really have any evidence of them uh, in any current humans. It would be uh, really interesting to see if uh, we can find some trace of their lineage in, in some Cuban, but we don't really know uh, of any traces of them. And um, so, but the Miccosukee and Seminoles, uh, there's, their roots start to begin uh, as they're pushed down into Florida. Uh, Bartram's come through, so we're getting some uh, biological, uh, you know, natural history inquiries. But uh, not only we lost our, the indigenous peoples, but uh, probably any crops they had were gone. Of course, they probably subsisted a lot on fishing and so forth, but there was certainly some uh, cultivation of uh, crops like corn and, and some beans. And then, so this was mostly, you know, Spanish and then British rule and, and back to Spain. And then the uh, USA declares its independence. And then Florida becomes a US uh, territory in T22. So here I got this graph where I'm gonna uh, depict a lot of events, uh, kind of overlaying the population growth in Florida. Um, Treaty of Maltry Creek. So that was establishing a large land reserve for uh, uh, Native Americans, which uh, of course eventually got pushed out of that area as well. Uh, Alvin Chapman. So this is our first botanist that lives in Florida and works uh, with a very serious intensity. So uh, before that, we really didn't have a lot of people collecting specimens, you know, documenting the flora in that way. Maybe, you know, we have write writings, but here, uh, this guy lives uh, in, around the Quincy area in the Panhandle, uh, Apalachicola area, Gadsden County. And um, he just 
Uh, you know, he lived there for about 60 years and, and collected a lot of specimens. So that was one of our very first serious botanists. Uh, here, but Henry Perini, so just to show some activity in South Florida, he's, he did some things in the Keys and brought the, the acicel agave uh, as a, uh, uh, hoping that that might have uh, 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 some commercial scale to produce uh, agave fibers for clothing and rope and so forth. And um, to give a sense of kind of, you know, the mindset of establishing uh, populations in Florida, this was an act um, from the Senate in 1832, promoting uh, the killing of any wolf, bear, tiger, or panther. So I, I'm not sure if tiger was applied to other animals or if uh, it kind of sounds like they just didn't know the territory enough and they thought, well, if there's tigers around, we want to kill them too. But this was a monetary compensation, right? So if you had any proof of killing these, uh, right, you got money. And the, you know, the idea to promote a better habitat for you know, uh, cattle and, and establishing um, uh, a human population in the area. And, uh, you know, of course, uh, we're losing these predators by killing them. But, uh, you know, even in the mid 1800s in Tallahassee, you know, you have the panther, right? We think of the panther as, as being strictly almost uh, the, in the Everglades these days, but it was throughout the state uh, back then. So this was an account of uh, a few people getting attacked by a panther and those people dispatching the panther. Um, and we have the Seminole Wars going around in the mid 1800s as well. So a very tumultuous time. And the flamingo. So the flamingo was a pretty common sight in the Keys at times. And it's thought that they even nested there. So they're like probably some um, year round residents. So it's not really common knowledge that the, the flamingo you know, was a native bird to Florida keys at, uh, at that time. And um, this is an account by a, a Worderman in 1857, where this, he goes out with a guy in a canoe and the guy just grabs tons, uh, uh, well, not literal tons, but he grabs a large amount of flamingos and just stuffs them in his canoe so that he can uh, la later sell them to anybody who wants uh, a flamingo. I forget if it's so much as meat or feathers and so forth, but it's just kind of showing how, you know, we just saw this land of plenty and they're just, you know, very reckless with it and just grabbing and, and killing everything we can. And just more of that. Um, so the use of strychnine, so uh, poisoning wolves. So that was uh, a common thing. And I liked how this uh, author summed up what he saw is that uh, there's just perpetual shooting at all seasons. So we just, you got, you know, we have guns and just shoot anything you feel like shooting. So the plume industry um, became very popular in the late 1800s and more of this, you know, just shooting anything you felt like. And of course we had a, a very large population decline where um, this uh, ward recounts in early 1900s seeing thousands of, of these uh, large uh, wetland birds and then going back and visiting you know just uh, a few years later or I don't know what the time lapse is there but just seeing only a handful of these same species you saw thousands of in the past and um, this is also around the time the passenger pigeon is no longer in Florida so it was in North Florida for a time and it's of course an extinct bird now and it was uh, disappearing at that time in Florida. Uh, the railroads are booming, so it's becoming very easy for people to populate and, and move to Florida or just travel there if, if they don't wanna move. Um, so this slide I just uh, dredged up a couple of days ago. I just came across it because uh, I was looking up the history of the Christmas bird count, which was kind of interesting. And it was suggest, um, it's basically, um, the origin of the Christmas bird count, I don't know if you guys know about the Christmas bird count, but uh, local birders often uh, throughout the country do a count of all the species of birds they can find. And it's a pretty amazing citizen science thing that has uh, started in basically 1900s. But it was kind of promoted because before that, again, there was just endless shooting of animals and it was like a game 
to go out and just see how many things you could shoot in one day. So here, this gun club uh, had a 24 hour shoot and they just tallied up everything they got. So 155 or 153 quail, this is the best uh, resolution I could get. A deer, turkey, 60 squirrels, 14 to six rabbits. Uh, and then Eddie says 22 birds were thrown out because they were killed on the ground. So it didn't even matter in their point system. And other birds, uh, maybe songbirds, I guess, were killed and uh, other game, whatever those were, but no points were given. So I guess they were too easy or weren't big enough. But it just shows again uh, how we're just, just killing lots of stuff. But um, we're noting, you know, people are noticing this, and this is just when um, we start to establish conservation and preservation in, in more of a legal framework. So the first national wildlife refuge, Pelican Island, and the fish, first national forest, I think, if I have that right, Ocala National Forest, established uh, in the early 1900s. So we're starting to uh, try to protect uh, more. And um, but around this time, it's it seems like flamingos have completely disappeared in Florida. Here's some uh, eggs that were collected in the Florida Keys, if everything is, is uh, denoted correctly on the label. So evidence that they did, at least some might have nest in Florida. Um, and around this time is when we get uh, John Kunkel Small, a very famous botanist. So he discovered a lot of uh, new species for Florida, describing them or just uh, discovering their presence here. And uh, also around this time, we have David Fairchild. So he's a famous uh, botanist of South Florida who established a lot of uh, new species to cultivate, like mangoes, avocados. He was really into uh, you know, what fruit crops we could bring. And uh, here's a picture of what uh, they called a highway back then. Uh, maybe they're just any road that's well traveled is, is a highway, but uh, I love the scenery to think that, you know, this is what a highway could have been back then. And, you know, that's not what a highway is anymore for us. But um, going into the uh, early 1900s, a little further, you know, the population is, is still fairly low, but we're rising quite a bit. Uh, so we start to make canals. So now we see South Florida as ha having a large potential for agriculture. And it's, we just started making, you know, these enormously long uh, canals to um, drain all the water out into the sea or the bay or the Gulf. And uh, completely fascinating how you can change a huge wetland like the Everglades like that so easily. Well, maybe not so easily, it's a lot of work, but um, 1914, so we have World War I, so kind of, important to see what global events are happening. And the zamia, so the kunti, the kunti plant, which is very popular in cultivation these days, uh, was being harvested uh, in incredible amounts for its starch. Uh, so it is a poisonous plant, but if it's processed uh, efficiently, you can get a edible starch out of it. And this was especially prevalent in Miami. So it's amazing to think about how much kunti was in the wild and these wild pinelands, especially in, in Miami, which there's still some there, of course, but how much used to be that back then is amazing because there are reports of them churning out tons, literal tons this time of starch per day. I, I can't even really fathom how many plants that is and how much uh, is just being dug up. And in Miami, it's a lot of, you know, a limestone. There's, it's not really sandy down there, so that was a lot of hard work to get these uh, subterranean stems of zamia out of the ground. And it was pretty remarkable. I'd love to see uh, how that was all done. I guess pickaxes and whatnot, but backbreaking work it sounds like. But still there's a mentality of, you know, shooting anything. Uh, here's a pine snake. Uh, this, this fellow was with a local resident and he saw a snake and he just shot it. He said, why'd you do that? You think I want to get bit? So it's treating every snake as a venomous you know, uh, enemy, which of course we know that's not the case, but it's, it's, you know, a lot of times we teach is, you know, be afraid of all snakes, be afraid of all spiders because we're not that good at identifying them perhaps. So it's understandable to have that perception, but 
you know, uh, wildlife education is a good thing for you know, stopping this kind of behavior. And uh, 1915, 1924, we, we start losing more species. Um, Baccarus dioica, so the common name of some common species are ground sill bush. These are some shrubby asters. Uh, but there was a species in this area of downtown Miami that was uh, fairly common probably back then based on records, but we can't find it anymore. Uh, the Carolina parakeet, that's, you know, that's so sad to think there was a native parakeet uh, throughout Florida and in the Carolinas, so it was the whole southeastern coastal plain. And, and the last known in Florida disappeared around then. And of course that's an extinct bird. And there was the Caribbean monk seal it's heartbreaking as well. Uh, so a seal that was of course uh, around in the Keys and throughout the Caribbean islands, and, and that went extinct totally in like 30s or 40s around then, but in Florida was last seen around probably the 1920s. A few plants uh, we can't find in the wild anymore. And John Kunkel Small, uh, this famous botanist, he tried to transplant a few things from downtown Miami. This is a, a tree that's related to uh, avocados and uh, like Red Bay, uh, uh, those, those trees in the Lauraceae, the Laurel family. Uh, it's, a, it's a rare tree down there. It's still there in, in down around this park in downtown Miami. But he no, noticed even in the 20s how things were just being, you know, bulldozed and, and destroyed. And he tried to transplant some of these uh, even back then. Uh, let's see where, so, um, more disappearance, the ivory-billed woodpecker, another extinct species, uh, you know, in a lot of old, uh, large, old growth forests, perhaps. Um, right, they've tried to search for that woodpecker in Louisiana and so forth for a long time, but it seems just well established that it's extinct. So it disappeared from Florida, it was uh, occurred throughout Florida, basically, uh, historically. And a wolf, so we were, there's, I was talking about you know poisoning wolves and shooting wolves. Well, we had wolves. We had native wolves in Florida, and the accounts of them are usually as these uh, very black, uh, pigmented hairs, uh, 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 American black wolf, if you will. Uh, here's Bartram in the 1790s describing them as perfectly black. So that's kind of one of those nuggets of information I like to hold on to that seems easily forgotten to to know that we had this native. Uh, black colored wolf and it's it's can't be found is it's basically treated as a, a, a subspecies or a variety of the red wolf which is extremely uh, endangered and there's very little of that species left uh, um, but you can find some on uh, uh, on a, a, an island I forget which island in the panhandle St. George's Island or something like that. They, there's a holdout population that was transplanted from uh, Texas, I think, or Louisiana. Uh, the whooping crane maybe might have been around in Florida here and there. There's this beach mouse that disappeared. Uh, so we've logged a lot of timber. So most of the huge trees are gone. And uh, a lot of the large animals, uh, panthers, bears, are, are plummeting in their populations. And pigs are, are on the rise, right? They're lo we're losing predators. so. What, what, why is the pig going to have a problem uh, expanding its range and population? And this, this author was of the opinion that you know, these bears and, and wolves and, poom, and panthers were the greatest predators of, of the pigs. So that would have kept them in check, but they're not in check so much anymore. Uh, other bizarre kind of things we did, uh, maybe not bizarre, but you know, somewhat uh, rampantly reckless uh, wild cotton eradication. So uh, this, this uh, report from 1950 estimated we had uh, destroyed 17 million uh, wild cotton plants uh, since 1933, so over a period of 17 years, because they were concerned about the cotton bull weevil and you know the cotton industry in the southeast. Um, and then there were wild cotton plants, uh, or primarily uh, on these coastal um, habitats like the Keys and, and coastal barrier islands and, and so forth. So they just destroyed them because they didn't want them to harbor you know, any of these pests. But it seemed like the pest wasn't really uh, going down into South Florida anyways. So it was 
probably unnecessary and to think what other collateral damage might have happened then. And there was a short period of trying to eradicate deers in South Central Florida because there was concern about uh, cattle ticks and cattle tick fever. But it didn't seem like uh, that really was uh, a necessary action either. <laughs> I guess, sorry, my daughter just, just showed up. Uh, she's, she's hungry, I guess. She wants something. And this was the time that the Hoover Dyke was completed. So this is kind of um, finalizing the drainage of, of the wetlands with all the canals and controlling water flow in South Florida. But this was partly the result of uh, a very devastating hurricane, I think it was in the 1920s, um, where thousands of people got killed in, in floods and so forth from a hurricane. So nowadays a hurricane is not as devastating as losing thousands of people here in the US. But um, you know, back then it was floods and such a hurricane, a major hurricane um, was a little bit more dangerous. So uh, having things like this was, you know, was a helpful thing, but that, you know, we're trying to restore the Everglades and, and, and have simultaneously, you know, control over, uh, over water levels and so forth. And uh, it's time of World War II beginning. Uh, here's a count of the Everglades saying that, you know, there used to be tons of wildlife and um, they've, there's been large scale drainage operations and fires were running rampant. So of course, fire is an important thing for a lot of Florida uplands, pinelands, especially. But here, you know, of course, lowering the water table, draining uh, the Everglades area, you're gonna have even drier conditions and more burning where places normally, a lot of these habitats wouldn't normally burn or at least not so severely. And he's saying that few of these birds, these, you know, ibises, herons and egrets were around anymore. This is a map showing uh, hogs. Uh, they've, you know, they've uh, populated the whole state and they're pretty widespread. Um, a few species of plants and, and uh, mouse no longer found and probably the lowest populations of uh, alligators and crocodiles and bears. Uh, but we established the Archibald Biological Station around this time. Um, some other things, red foxes uh, coming in. Uh, here's some, some orchid tales. It's hard to find accounts of, uh, at least for me it was, to find accounts of, of all these poaching of orchids, you know, and, and them disappearing. It's, it seems a lot of uh, hearsay, but, and of course it happened. But uh, to get a, you know, a real vivid image of it, uh, uh, an account, you know, some anecdote, it's, I couldn't find much, but, you know, they just were saying you know, wagon loads leaving, leaving all these uh, South Florida habitats, like around uh, Big Cypress region and so forth. And a lot of orchids we can't find anymore in the wild. Uh, and this is a grass and this is a, this is a peperomia, uh, another epiphyte. Um, and this is a fern, epi ep epiphytic fern. So orchids and other epiphytes. Uh, Macrodenia's orchid, and this is a this is a more of a tree. But things that we document kind of around this time and no longer can find anymore. And you can see the population, you know, is dramatically accelerating at this time. You know, I guess we have air conditioning uh, after the fifties and so forth. Um, and in more recent times, uh, thinking about what cats have done. And so, you know, we have a lot of people feeding feral cats and we have them as pets as well. And it's a difficult thing to uh, address, right? So to care for a cat, but to not realize, you know, especially in the nocturnal animals, what they're doing in the night. And this is an estimate of, you know, how many they kill each year, small mammals and birds, uh, millions upon millions. And the drainage of the Everglades, uh, this was a great study uh, looking at uh, these decreases in hydro periods, so, you, know, you know, like when the water is flooding and so forth, right? So marshes are not being as, are not as wet as cypress stands and ponds. 
And uh, more things, Besky Seaside Sparrow. Uh, can't find that anymore. This is a very interesting thing, this uh, lichen. So this is a, you know, a fungus that has a, an algae, has a photosynthetic uh, symbiont a partner in this relationship. And this was just described uh, a year or two ago. So we didn't even know it as a species until a year or two ago. But our documents of this species only go up into the 80s and now we can't find it. And this was uh, something mainly around the Ocala National Forest, so North Florida. Uh, so maybe it's still around. But uh, as far as we know, we can't seem to find it. Um, coyotes, right? So coyotes are also invading Florida. Uh, so we've lost a lot of our larger predators. Uh, so now there's room for other predators, uh, a larger predator compared to some things, but still a fairly small canine coming throughout Florida. So, you know, we've probably read a lot of these very sad uh, accounts of things you know, defaunation, the loss of, of all these animals throughout the world, dramatic insect declines, and we have some loss in plants uh, in the continental U.S. and Canada. And uh, introductions, so not just losses, introductions. I did a study trying to uh, count how many different plant species have been brought to Florida. You know, not just the ones that have naturalized, but things we've cultivated, even in greenhouses, you know, specialized places and botanic gardens, all that. So I estimated maybe around 9,000 uh, plant species brought to Florida, you know, in recent times by us in the you know, past hundred years, mostly. And um, about 1,500 uh, have been become naturalized. Of course, that includes things we don't intentionally bring, just weeds that might have been uh, uh, attaching to our socks or something like that, but so that includes everything. But you know, maybe one ten or fifteen or so uh, naturalized, and then maybe one uh, or two uh, out of a hundred probably uh, become what we might call invasive. You know, like the Brazilian pepper. Right? It's invasive. It's everywhere. It's invasive in natural, nice habitats that we don't even have, have not even disturbed that much. And then think about all the reptile introductions, especially South Florida again. Um, I gotta move my window, I can't see everything here. So we uh, over a hundred reptile introductions and about half or so, a little less than half established, right? They have established populations. Uh, when I was living in Miami just a few years ago, had iguanas in my yard um, all the time. Sometimes they were destroying things I planted, which was a little aggravating, but. Uh, lots of anoles and other small lizards down there. And then honeybees. All right. So, you know, I love honey. And uh, we often report on, you know, the decline of honeybees or colony collapses. But there are also, you know, introduced species that have basically followed European uh, establishment in this country. And, you know, that's, it's not a good thing necessarily for everything else, like native bees and, and other native insects, right? It's amazing. You can find honeybees in so many places, you know, in, in a coastal hammock. Um, they just seem to be everywhere. And uh, it's something that native wildlife has to compete with. Uh, whoops, there we go. Uh, so a summary of all these uh, things that I've kind of been mentioning. So. You know, before Europeans, pre-Columbian, large mammals extinct. What else may have been lost? It's hard to say. Probably other things, but um, even a bivalve, there's there's a suggestion, um, some evidence that a mollusk uh, in the panhandle was around and then lost. And then since, you know, the past 500 years, a couple plants gone completely extinct for birds. So that was like the ivory-billed woodpecker. Carolina parakeet, passenger pigeon, and dusky seaside sparrow. So the monk seal's gone, uh, the red wolf, uh, the, the, the melanized black version of that wolf's gone, some mice, gophers, yeah. lichen. And I always, I like to speculate about the crops that we've lost. It's fascinating. The indigenous people might've grown. And the extirpation, so things that have uh, left Florida, but still occur in other places. So like the, they might still be alive in the Caribbean or north of Florida, but mostly South Florida, we've lost a lot of plants that we can't find anymore. 
and flamingos and uh, uh, the Zeneda dove, I think that was we lost to. So, uh, you know, lots of change. This map is just kind of showing what uh, the Florida Natural Areas Inventory and uh, NatureServe came together to show what they thought was, uh, what places were most at risk. So in these bright uh, yellowish colors where there's a lot of biodiversity and then there's a lot of, you know, human encroachment upon that biodiversity. So Miami, uh, the Pine Ridge especially has a lot of suitable human habitat, right? It's, it's, it's like the highest elevation in Miami, but it has a lot of rare species. And then we have, uh, you know, citrus and, and cattle, a lot of interior Florida, and a lot of really rare species along the Lake Wales Ridge, a lot of rare species in the Panhandle and the Apalachicola region. So that's a kind of a nice map. But, uh, you know, I talked a lot, of, talked a lot about a loss, but there's also a lot going for us, a lot of uh, protection. So these are a lot of entities that own and manage uh, preservation, preserved lands in Florida. And, you know, I've traveled a little bit in this world and, and coming back to Florida, I do guys say, I, I feel pretty proud of, of things like this, that not a lot of places have this much energy and effort and, and resources towards uh, protecting uh, their wildlife and biodiversity. And we got, you know, the Native Plant Society very active, but not a lot of places have all that stuff. So I think, uh, you know, we're doing good and, and we got to stay focused and, and, and positive about all we accomplish and continue to do. And we even uh, increase our native plant diversity. So and what I mean is um, one of our first uh, comprehensive accounts of what species we had in Florida uh, listed about uh, 2,600 vascular plants including uh, subspecies and varieties. And it's continued to climb by about 250 over the years because we, we find a species we didn't know was here. You know, maybe somebody was in uh, you know, Columbia County, some county along the Florida state line and, and found a species, or we describe a new species that continues to occur, or we, um, we, we realize that there's more species of something here than we previously thought because we study it a little bit more. Um, there's another Flores. This is a weekly. Where's my mouse? This is an, another author who we even recognizes uh, more species in Florida. And that's just kind of based on uh, whether you want to split or lump, you know, taxonomy kind of stuff. Uh, here's an example of a recently described species. So this is a, in the panhandle, Fothergilla, uh, a shrubby thing. And um, so some people studied it and, and realized, hey, what? what's in Florida and, and around Florida, uh, I think in Alabama and, and Georgia as well, if I remember, uh, is a different species than what we've been calling it. So they named a new species for that area, uh, for that species in Florida, uh, Fothergilla milleri, and decided what it had been called was actually uh, restricted to the Carolinas or, or somewhere around there. I forget which species that was, but so uh, studying, you know, these groups realizing that there's more to it that's not all one species, but there's actually several species. Uh, and here's uh, Scott Ward finding uh, carex. So it's a sedge, you know, something that looks kind of like a grass, not pretty flowers, but a very diverse in Florida sedges and uh, doing some work in Gadsden County. So up in North Florida and finding some, a new a species that um, just barely gets down into Florida. And this cool graph, I'm hoping to publish this uh, this year, is uh, showing uh, a timeline of, of us describing the species native to Florida. So it begins with Linnaeus. So he's kind of you know, the father of taxonomy, binomial nomenclature. So he described about 600 species that are native to Florida, but he didn't study any material from Florida. So he was studying material from the Carolinas and Virginia, and they just think, happen to be things that also occur in Florida. And it wasn't really until uh, after the 1770s and more so uh, when Bartrams came through and Andre Michaud came through and Chapman started doing work that we really uh, had people going to Florida and describing species from Florida. And you can see this thing continues to climb uh, and it hasn't really 
you know, reach that plateau uh, that from that asymptote. So we're probably going to continue to describe new species. Um, I'm sure it'll slow down, but one or two years seems to be kind of an average over the past uh, 50 years. And this shows uh, how much uh, effort we put into botany in Florida. By that, it's, it's counting how many plant specimens, so herbarium specimens, so we go out and collect plants and make specimens out of them. We keep those in herbarium, uh, like a museum setting. And it's just showing that, you know, some places like Miami or Alachua County where University of Florida is or Leon County where FSU is, we've collected a lot of plants. But other places like Hendry County, uh, very rural, away from universities and cities, we haven't done a lot there. There's probably more to discover, at least on a county level. And um, uh, Baker County, uh, Lafayette and Suwannee County, Glades County. So there's still a lot of work to do to really thoroughly understand um, Florida. And um, there's kind of examples of things we're still um, you know, deciding what's rare and what's, uh, here's a plant, uh, it's a uh, in the uh, cucumber family. It's not even endangered, but there's only one population in uh, in South Florida. It's my daughter lamenting being taken away from me. But uh, this thing isn't endangered. But I was going to try to propose that it would be endangered. So you know, we're still kind of listing species and saying, "Wow, that's rare." Or this thing. This euphorb, euphorbia, it loves really nice beaches, that kind of habitat, and it can't seem to find it still occurring in Florida. Uh, although it's, there might be, there's at least kind of a, one recent collection um, in Collier County in some remote keys. So that might be one of its stronghold, last strongholds in Florida. There's an amaranth we can't find anymore in Florida. Uh, but, you know, again, it hasn't been declared extinct really. Um, it's not something most people notice these amaranths, but we're still you know, learning that uh, what we're losing or noticing what we're losing and trying to hold on. And uh, this is just an example of some awesome work. I was in South Florida for a while, so this is just something I'm familiar with, but uh, uh, Fairchild Tropical Botanic Garden has this nice program where they give free native plants to homeowners that sign up. So. You can get some pine rockland plants, very rare, very rare, cool stuff they give out because they're trying to, you know, promote native plants and establish a more of a wildlife corridor and, and that kind of thing. So that's pretty awesome. And this was just uh, World War I, the, uh, you know, uh, victory gardens and things, so, you know, for vegetables and so forth. So I was just kind of playing around with that and victory gardens for biodiversity. So, you know, it's, we're doing awesome stuff by promoting native plants and trying to convert our yards more into wildlife sanctuaries. Um, and more things we could study. We, we barely know much about mosses in Florida, mosses and liverworts. This is showing how much activity in collecting those. Seminole County and Leon County being well collected. The rest of the state, not so much. Uh, it's showing a timeline of that. And these are species we don't know much about. This is that lichen I was talking about that from Ocala that we can't seem to find. Uh, I did some work on some mushrooms. I, lo I love studying mushrooms too. But we, we have so little knowledge about fungi in Florida. It's kind of amazing. This is a mushroom from the Keys Then I'm certain, uh, almost certain is an undescribed species. This is a species from uh, burned pinelands. It's really cool, it shows up after fires. It might be undescribed. Um, this is a um, sponge, freshwater sponge and it's, I was hoping I, I found a sponge and I could just find a sponge specialist. And I was just like, no one really studying freshwater sponges in Florida. And this is um, a, uh, a moth caterpillar, maybe butterfly. I'm not, I'm not a leptodopterist, but just occurring on this um, specific plant in South Florida that I kept noticing, but I never got to figure out what it was because it's, there might be a specialist that knows, but it's, again, it's hard to find some knowledge on these things and maybe we don't know about it. Uh, another fungus I found in undescribed. This is a cool plant that's very rare. It's a spider in the keys. I couldn't get anybody identified, but again, I didn't collect it and send it to a spider specialist. So 
it might be easy thing for a spider biologist i don't know but it's just you know it's there's a lot of mystery out there still a lot of mystery and uh you know Sometimes it's hard to argue why we say things like freshwater mussels. You know, most people aren't going to interact directly with a freshwater mussel. So I thought this was a cool paper. You know, he says most people would give mussels a value of, of almost nil. You know, why would I care about that? But that's one of the great challenges that we have and why uh, I, I get to, you know, have a cool job and love my job is to, to study things like mussels or fungi or, or plants and to transmit that special knowledge to other people um, that can disseminate it as educators or find value, you know, who can make summaries of the economic value of things. It's a very abstract thing to give muscles a, a dollar value, but, you know, we're realizing more and more how much a biodiversity favors us for the most part. It's good for us. Um, so, uh, there's just some cool studies about that and that, for example, uh, sometimes in ecology they say a species can be redundant functionally, but I think that's a, a very overly simplistic way to look at things and that no species is redundant. Uh, it just doesn't make sense. Of course, extin extinctions are, are natural in you know, some way, but even then, once a species is gone, it's gone. And you know, the human way of life is really to, to retain information and possibility because you never know what we're gonna encounter. So, you know, why not I try to save things? Uh, so just a few thing, people to thank or institutions, but you know, there's hundreds of people that are thousands of thousands of people really, maybe millions, I guess, <laughs> we're all in this together. So I guess I gotta go billions, but these are just uh, some of the entities, uh, you know, I work for University of Florida and the Florida Museum now. So I'm grateful for their uh, support. Uh, I did a lot of work at USF. I was just at FIU three years prior. Native Plant Society, I've interacted with quite a bit. They're awesome. Fairchild is, does some cool stuff. Um, and uh, this is the Institute for Regional Conservation. Really amazing uh, organization that's kind of keeping track of everything at a much more local level in South Florida. So like, you know, what species is no longer in Miami and so forth. So a lot of that knowledge is from them. Uh, this is some my parents and step parents and children and, and my dog and, and my wife. So of course uh, my family are, are a lot of the reasons I to, uh, do the things I do and have the support that I do. That's my abstract. Okay, so I'll stop there. And uh, if you have any questions, I'd certainly love to hear them and hopefully have some uh, interesting answers for you. Oh, Aaron, you're still muted there. I'm still muted. Now I'm there. Okay, so that was awesome. And this is a, we have some, a short time for anybody that would like to squeeze in a question for Dr. Frank. Thank you for sharing that. You clearly have a plethora of, of uh, research on, on these things. I love all the little yeah, yeah, grabs it took a long showcasing. Time put all that together. I was, okay. I was hoping to kind of publish something just in this vein, put all this stuff together. Cause yeah, I couldn't really find a good synopsis of all these things, but. Oh, let's see. If anybody has questions, this is the time, feel free to go ahead and do that in the chat. And um, I had one question. It was a, a slide, a couple of slides back it was the uh, the dark and then the light orange colorings, the dark purples and then light oranges. Oh, this one. What did the dark purple mean? Oh, uh, that's just that's where they estimate that biodiversity is not so much at risk. Oh, it's not at risk. Yeah, the bright orange, yellow orange is where you know there's a lot of endemism, a lot of unique rare species, and then there's a lot of uh, human disturbance pretty much where that has to kind of be balanced with with these things so Lake Wales Ridge there's a lot of unique diverse biodiversity uh, the Miami Ridge and the Apalachicola Coal region so that's so there's kind of like hot spots biodiversity um, 
Uh, but there's other areas like the Suwannee River um, that, that need protection too. The Okeechobee Gourd. So uh, I, I haven't studied that one. Oh, I'm skipping a question, I see. Sorry. Um, let me just go with the Okeechobee Gourd real quick. So as far as I know, that's still around, but I, I honestly haven't seen it in the wild and I don't know about anybody keeping up on that plant, which is um, a very interesting plant and that um, its closer, closest relative seems to be um, another plant in Mexico. So it's like, how did it get here? Was it by trade or was it actually native here? Um, but it certainly seems to be something that predated European arrival. But I don't have any recent updates about the Okeechobee gourd and what's happening to it. Okay, and we have another one here. It says, uh, when I was in Sequoia Kings Canyon, and P, where's he? Uh, they, okay, uh, they intimate, intimated that uh, sequoias grew in Florida. Do you know th of that evidence? I don't know of any such evidence uh, of that nature. Maybe, maybe longer ago. I mean, I, I was only scratching into kind of the human history of Florida, so that fifteen thousand years ago. So maybe there's something further back then. I don't really know. But I had, I haven't heard that myself. This has been uh, fantastic. I've enjoyed it quite a bit, quite a bit. And um, what is this? Okay, it says Mark Minow has been keeping track of Okeechobee boards okay. along the St. John's River. Very good. Yeah, I've interacted uh, with. It. A few times. Yeah, I never really talked about the Okeechobee gourd though. So that's that's good to know. It's you know, there's so many rare species to keep keep track of. So I uh, we're gonna go ahead and we we um if I'm not mistaken, we record this and save this. And you could you send um a copy of that presentation to myself and then I, I think that's how it works I'll, I'll double check but um we're gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna be reading on some of this stuff because this is all new for me so I'm excited to have this um and it says here I found out that endangered plants are highly regulated and require permitting for an indiv individual to grow would like to know your thoughts on why that is um I mean my understanding and it's really the, the the permitting process is harvesting in the wild so like if I want to study a plant, a rare endangered plant in the wild, I have to get a permit to harvest it to make a specimen or collect it for DNA analysis or whatever. But, um, you know, they can be, once, you know, once somebody has a, a plant and they're propagating it, it's pretty much in the legal framework from there on out. So um, there are a lot of, you know, we have endangered plants that are, that are cultivated without any sort of permitting process that goes along with it. Um, like, uh, I'm pretty sure this one's endangered. Uh, the, uh, what's the common, I'm terrible with common names, but uh, uh, this yellow anise tree or star anise. Um, it's not really cultivated in, in uh, like the Sarasota area, but North Florida and so forth, Elysium parviflorum is endangered, but it's extremely common as a, as a hedge. Uh, it's, it's planted as a hedge in Tampa, it's all over Gainesville as a hedge. So it's endangered, but there's really, it's all over my yard actually, it's been planted here before I got here. So it's not really regulated in the cultivated context there. It's just, we're, we wanna conserve bio, it's, it's a genetic diversity and so forth in this wild population. So you can't really just harvest anything from the wild like that, but. Um, uh, it says here, Erica is, is with me. She's fascinated by the talk, really enjoyed it. She's going to go back to the recording again to uh, glean more information. Mm -hmm. And I think this would probably be a good one for the last question. Also, even though coyotes aren't from Florida, would you say that they now play an important role in our ecosystem as one of the few apex predators? Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not uh, an expert on, on, on animal, wild animals in Florida per se, but you know, coyotes are, um, you know, they're omnivores, so they're not, you know, really preying on large mammals as far as I know as much. 
so they're I don't really know what they eat but they're you know they're not that big and they don't I'm sure they eat mice and things like that when they can and they'll eat berries and and all sorts of things really but I don't really know that much about coyotes to to say much more but I was kind of suggesting in my talk that they've replaced the larger predators so uh, as you phrase your question it, it does seem like that's kind of what's happening in a way but it, you know it's hard to say but yeah basically you know panthers very large predator and the, the red wolf was a very large predator and the wolf gone uh, the panther almost gone except now in south florida uh, bears have some nice populations you know in ocala and uh big cypress region but they were of course much more widespread and, and big predators too also omnivores but you know those are kind of three big ones that have largely reduced their numbers. So I would guess that would make more room for coyotes. I mean, there's gotta be some competition there. Um, well, I, once again, thank you very much for being here, taking time to be here for all of your research and your sharing for today. Um, thank you. All and, right. Yeah. And I look forward to seeing, I might see your name on that graph that you showed us, finding something new to donate oh. to our, our knowledge. Oh yeah, that, that graph was just, uh, where was just to kind of answer it. I mean, that was just kind of the, the major players. So yes. I've kind of you know done some plant taxonomy in Florida, but uh, these were like people that had um, described 50 or more or something like, or 20 or more. I don't, I don't remember what the cutoff was I used, but. I don't think I'll ever make it in these ranks because there was, okay. was more of a wide open landscape for botany then. But, but yeah, I, I do try to contribute in my way as well, of course. But I mean, we all are by being part of the Native Plant Society. It's, it's exactly. a good thing. And I liked the effort um, that um, you had mentioned also about the developers in South Florida offering free natives. I like that, that sticks. I think oh, it's, it's not, they're not developers, but it's, a, it's the Fairchild Botanic Garden. Oh, it, to um, new, to people that move into the area? Well, no, just anybody that lives there basically. Oh, um, okay. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know if you necessarily have to be, I forget if it's a homeowner or not precisely, but the, yeah, the idea is that you would be planting these things in your yard or, you know, or something like that and trying to develop a little more pine rockland habitat. But there's a few things that aren't strictly pine rockland, but um, yeah, it's the Botanic Garden and uh, you just sign up and you get, get one free round of plants. So I got some things I had never really seen before in the wild. So I was exciting me just to have these plants to see and study. But, yeah, uh, it there's, some you know, ideas. there's a lot of similar things. There's native, you know, a lot of native plant nurseries that sell things and there's other initiatives people yeah. giving away plants. That was just one I was familiar with. So spark some fun ideas. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Allison Bishop, she's saying the FSMP can do that event and uh, partner with something like Selby or the county. Good idea. Maybe yeah, just spark something. Good idea. Great, great ideas to be had there. So, um, well, thank you. And um, a reminder to everybody that, like I said, there's that field trip coming up on the 20th. It is at, uh, what did we say, Braden Woods and um, Carpool, if you can. Also, there's the Fire Fest on the 29th. And then our next meeting is Justin Bloom from Suncoast Waterkeeper. And he's going to be doing a tour through local waterways to discover how Suncoast Waterkeeper protects and restores them through enforcement, field work, advocacy, and education. So that's coming up on the 21st of February. You guys are all welcome to come back. I hope to see you then. Maybe I'll see some faces at the field trip. I'll be there and Firefest. So with that, um, I think we're good. All right, guys. Any of we're good? I guess that's it. I missed one day we'll be in person again and I can see your faces all and we can go back to our natural ways. <laughs> but until then, thank you for being here. All right, thanks for having me. Thank you. Bye-bye.